कॉम्रेड साथियों एक सौ चौंतीसवाँ योम मई हम एक बहुत ही बदतरीन सूरत हाल में मना रहे हैं ये ऐसी सूरत हाल है जिसमें पूरी इंसानियत जो है वबा का शिकार है कोरोना की वबा ने करोड़ों इंसानों को मुतासर किया है और इसके नतीजे में ना सिर्फ नौ इंसान जो है उसकी बका ख़तरे में पड़ गई है बल्कि पूरी दुनिया की इकानमी भी उसके बुनियाद के ऊपर तबाही का शिकार है इसके नतीजे में करोड़ों लोग बेरोज़गार हो गए हैं और करोड़ों से भी ज़्यादा अरबों की तादाद में इससे इकनॉमिकली मुतासर हुए हैं इस सूरत हाल में पूरी दुनिया का जो हेल्थ का सिस्टम है वो आवाम को लोगों को मुतासर करने में या उनकी ज़िंदगी को बचाने में नाकाम हो गया है इसी तरीके से जो इकनॉमिक सिस्टम है वो भी कोलेप्स हो गया है इस सूरत हाल में खूस पाकिस्तान में हम ये देखते हैं कि तकरीब एक करोड़ बीस लाख इंसानों के खूस तौर पर मेहनत कशों के बेरोज़गार होने का अगले तीन या चार माह में ख़तरा पैदा हो गया इस वक्त भी कोई छः मिलियन के करीब वर्कर्स जो हैं वो बेरोज़गार हो चुके हैं रियासत जो है वो सेहत की सहूलियत मुहैया करने में नाकाम हो गई है और टेस्टिंग की किट्स की जो ज़रूरत थी वो देने में नाकाम हो गई है इसी तरीके से जो हेल्थ के वर्कर्स हैं जो इस करोना की वबा से लड़ रहे हैं उनको भी प्रोटेक्शन देने में नाकाम हो गई है फैक्ट्रियों कारखानों के अंदर हकूमती अहकाम के मुताबिक के बावजूद जो है वर्कर्स को जॉब से निकाला जा रहा है उनकी उजरतें नहीं दी जा रही इस्टेट बैंक ने मालिकान को इंडस्ट्रियलिस्ट को ये सहूलत फराम की है कि वो तीन परसेंट लोन के ऊपर जो है वो तीन महीने की तनख्वाहें दे सकते हैं लेकिन सरमायादारों ने वो लोन भी लेने से इनकार कर दिया है इस सूरत हाल में एक ही रास्ता बचता है कि मेहनत कश तबका जो है इस वबाई सूरत हाल का ना सिर्फ ख़ुद मुकाबला करे बल्कि सरमायादारी के जितने इजहार हैं उसको जो है ख़ात्मे के लिए जदोजहद करे आज के दिन के मौके पर हमारा मुतालबा है कि सारी दुनिया में हेल्थ की फैसिलिटीज़ को फ्री किया जाए इसी तरीके से तमाम वर्कर्स जो हैं उनकी जॉब को बैन अवी तौर पर प्रोटेक्शन करने का तरीका कार तय किया जाए और लोगों को नौकरियों से निकालने का और उनको जो है उनकी जो उजरतें रोकने का सिलसिला बंद किया जाए इस आज के दिन हम पूरी दुनिया के मेहनत कशों से मुतालबा करते हैं जब जब इंसानी तारीख़ में वबा या कोई भी इस तरह का बहरान आया है उस बहरान से निकलने के लिए एक नई तारीख रकम हुई है और हम ये समझते हैं कि वबा के खात्मे के साथ ही कैपिटलिज़म के खात्मे का भी इम्कान पैदा हो जाएंगे मज़दूर जदोजहद जिंदाबाद मज़दूरों का बैन अवी इतिहाद जिंदाबाद Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Enin Banke, and I welcome you to the third episode of the School of Resistance, a project by IIPM, Entegent, Academie der Kunste Berlin, Medico International, and funded by Kulturstiftung des Bundes. A School of Resistance is a bi-weekly live stream format that tries to create an online think tank on change with experts in resistance. The live stream takes the fallout of the global economy um, caused by COVID-19. as a starting point and an entry to think about possible solutions and alternatives this current crisis might give rise to. Uh, to do so, we invite experts on change and resistance from all over the world. Um, and for this episode entitled Distributing Dignity, Global Supply Chains and Human Rights, we invited political activists Nasir Mansour and Zera Khan. I am very happy and very honored as well to welcome the both of you, Zera Nasir, Um, thank, thank you very much for joining me in this conversation tonight. Um, but let me properly introduce you first. Um, our first guest is Sira Khan. She's a political activist and a committed feminist. Um, she's the general secretary of the Home-Based Women's Workers Federation. And that's a union that um, organizes women who work either as home workers or in informal uh, employment. in textile companies, the packaging industry, weaving mills, um, carpet, jewelry production, and the manufacturing of footballs. And next to Zira is our second guest, which is Nasir Mansour, uh, and who has been a political activist already since his student days at Karachi University, where he participated in the resistance against the long-term military dictator, Ziaul Uhr. and being the Deputy General Secretary of the National Trade Union Federation Pakistan, Nasir mainly defends the rights of the Pakistani uh, textile workers. That also brings us um, to the topic of this episode, namely the current working and living situation of um, textile workers in Pakistan 
and the current status of the uh, global production and supply chains of what we call our global economy. Um, because more than anything, um, COVID-19 illustrated the patterns of our global production and also how codependent the lives uh, of our global society have become. In countries such as Pakistan and Bangladesh, um, these interdependencies have devastating consequences uh, with thousands of workers that lost their job and are suffering from the um, effects the human rights crisis has and that has been raging uh, for such a long time in our global capitalist uh, system. Before we start this conversation, I quickly want to remind you of the possibility uh, to enter into this conversation. You can do that by asking questions, uh, either by sending them to our email address, uh, School of Resistance at by commenting on the live stream on Facebook or uh, via Twitter, by using the hashtag School of Resistance. Uh, I will take on most of them probably at the end um, of the live stream, but I will also try to forward them and to present them to my guests throughout the conversation. Maybe it's a good way um, to start by reflecting on what we saw, on what this live stream opened with, because uh, that was a speech that Nasser gave on the occasion of the uh, International Workers' Day and where he already quickly touched upon um, the crisis in Pakistan that is happening now. Um, but I think it might be good if we could start and open this conversation by sketching out the scope and the gravity of the current situation of the garment workers in Pakistan. Um, because in a text you wrote, Nasi, for the occasion of this debate, um, you mentioned that more than 6 million workers have already uh, lost their job and that econ economists expect this number to rise to more than 17 million in the next coming of days, weeks, months. Um, could you perhaps contextualize these numbers of job losses, of other labor violations that are happening in Pakistan today and comment on the main causes that lie behind them? Uh, first, uh, thank you to invite me. Uh, Sometime is a very rare opportunity that uh, people from global south speak to, with the international uh, on that kind of forums where we can raise our voices. And it's a good that we have uh, good comrades and friends and the network that uh, uh, loud our voices. Uh, what we speak, they will give us a louder. Uh, dimension and louder uh, impact in a society where there is a lot of consumers. So uh, I can share it with that uh, what is happening at the moment and we uh, have a double kind of uh, effect. Uh, before the corona there was in 2019 uh, there was an agreement with the IMF in a July 2019 which forced Pakistani government to make us some drastic uh, changes in their economies and which is which affect a lot on the workers uh, the first thing was that uh, they have withdraw all the subsidy to the textile and garment sector it called a zero rating system it was withdrawn so it means that now after that there was a lot of pressure on the textile and garments because they are uh, getting the electricity and uh, gases on a very high prices that was the crisis with the textile and garment and which make all effect on the other sectors also. The other one was that uh, Pakistani currency was slash, uh, the value of currency was uh, depreciated for uh, more than 30 to 35 percent. So it means that uh, actual uh, wages of the worker will decrease around the 50 percent. And then there is a withdrawal of a state subsidy on all the all things. So it will increase uh, daily use item from 40 to 50 percent. There was uh, charges on electric electricity and uh, gas charges increase uh, about a 50 to 200 percent. Medicines increase uh, about a two 300 percent. So it was a drastic effect on the working workers and uh, ordinary peoples. So even when we were talking about it, we were discussing that one, and there was a crisis in the industry. Then the coronavirus uh, crisis come in the 
month of January. And the government was very much, they are very conservative and they don't care about it. They think that it is nothing. It is for only Europe. It is only for the uh, countries where it, there is a cold and a country like Pakistan where temperature is uh, more than 40 degrees Celsius. So it can't affect us. And then they, they don't care about what the uh, medical uh, experts, trade union people, conscious people always tell them that that is a big problem. So you should not uh, follow uh, British and Americans or Iranians. You have to look into it, how the Vietnam and other countries, they have looked into the things. So they always gave us the example of uh, South uh, British, there is a new problem. But when there the problem started, then they get a new excuse. Now there is a more than a 100,000 uh, positive cases, out of which uh, 200 workers, 2,000 people died. The, the very unfortunate thing is that in last three months, only 1,000 people died. And the, in last 10 days, in a June, 100, 1,000 work people died. So it's a multiplying now. So the effect is a very strong on a textile and garment. There was a lockdown and a lockdown because of the lockdown, as I told about that uh, around the six, six million workers has been retained from their job, out of which 70% uh, are from textile and garment. Textile and garment is there uh, around the $27 billion each year we fetch as a foreign exchange through a textile and garment. So it means that uh, there's a totally collapse. Nothing is happening over there. Uh, order has been canceled. The brands have withdrawn all their orders. And every day we are getting uh, a news that uh, workers were returned from their factories and uh, departments. So the government announced that a trillion of Pakistani rupees as a compensation, as a package to the industry and industrial, especially for the textile and garment. But they have announced for the workers, but they don't give it to the workers. Worker didn't get out of it. Any. So I think that uh, because of IMF policies and now is because of the Corona, we are totally uh, industry is the, at the verge of collapse. And our own policies, IMF policies and international brands have withdrawal there. Uh, facilities. You see, H&M has given a uh, five hundred thousand or dollars to WHO, yeah, to show that to people that he, that company is uh, very much. Uh, they are talking about social responsibility, and they want to show that they have the human face. But in the ground, the factories where they get their productions, they are retrenching workers just in one factory. 15,000 workers have been retrenched within that period of a corona and the lockdown. And in the one factory, there was a firing of the workers and the case was registered against the workers and workers were arrested and they were sent to the jail. And now, today we get to know that they were now bailed out from the jail, but the cases are them against them. And the FIR, our first information report with the police was uh, put in a way that they put three names and 800 unknown names of the workers. So any worker can put in it and everybody, they say that if you talked about union, about your rights, about your wages, uh, or about your bonuses, they will put their name on an unknown worker who have attacked. So the police will arrest them. So that come kind of a fear they are putting on the workers and number of factories which are producing for H&M, Levi's, Mango, Adidas, uh, Inditex, all these in these factories, these kinds of happening every day. Somewhere we, we get to know about it, in majority of factories we don't know about it because workers don't know about their rights at the moment. So that is a big and huge problem over here in Pakistan, especially in a textile and garment. I am just talking about the problem in, inside the factories where somehow the workers are visible, their employers are visible. Zara Metai talked about uh, in a supply chain where there's yeah. a problem where the invisible workers are there. 
So yes. I think yeah. it's a big issue at the moment in Pakistan, and uh, it uh, it will be a everyday thing. Today is a budget day in Pakistan. Government is going to announce their budget, yeah. annual budget, and there is no remedy for the workers. So they everybody uh, employers say that they don't have money, so they can't pay to the workers. The workers say that they have lost their jobs. They are losing, losing their livelihoods, so they need government uh, subsidies and help. But the government don't have any plan about it. But they are using that uh, days and the corona against the workers. Two days ago, uh, 9,500 workers from Pakistani steel mill has been retrenched by the government. And yesterday, uh, 11,000 polio workers, majority of them, 90% have been they were retrenched from their jobs and they were recruited by the UNICEF, recruited by the WHO. And they have retrained their workers at a time when the government have an ordinance, a new special law that no worker can be retrenched or uh, unpaid during the lockdown. But you see that uh, UNO bodies, who are the sister organizations of ILO, and ILO says about uh, workers' rights and number of things, but these uh, UNICEF and the WHO also doing whatever the private sector employers are doing with the workers. That is the worst condition. And we are looking into it next time. If you ask question, I will let you know how could we cope it with it and how could we uh, catching the need of the workers. Yeah, yeah. you already briefly touched upon it, like the, the supply chains that there's a big problem and that the consequences are now severely visible in countries as Pakistan, but also Bangladesh. Um, yeah. And the fact that they are so um, much affected by um, catastrophes that happen in China, but also decisions that are made by big international uh, travel industries in places like Europe, for instance, shows how entangled our lives have become. Um, yet a big part of the world doesn't or it doesn't seem to be familiar, or rather doesn't want to be familiar with um, with the story behind the t-shirts they um, sell. I heard this phrase once, if, uh, if you follow the production chain of a big multinational brand, you're likely to end up in um, the home, in the house of a home-based woman worker. Um, and that made me wonder, Zira, if you could perhaps explain us a bit how these supply chains usually work in, um, the global textile industry, what countries Pakistan is connected to, for instance, but also um, particularly the share of these women workers um, in the garment production that are so important but are barely visible. Uh, yes, uh, uh, like uh, global supply, we are saying that the supply chain is the way for the employers or the uh, industrialists is the way to reduce the cost or paying the less uh, to the workers and getting the more and more benefits. So they use all the platform which uh, they have, uh, they can go to. So uh, so the women are, majority are the women who are engaged with this sector. So uh, you can say that the garment industry is rapidly shifting from uh, formal work to for informal work. So there is the two kinds of work like in factory, which is the formal work, but it is also becoming the informal. So now workers are uh, higher on the third party system and even the, in, uh, on the contract basis. So workers, many workers are working on the fees rate, not on the salary. So, uh, and the second, second sector is the home-based sector or the informal sector in which the domestic workers, agriculture workers, hawkers, all these uh, people coming in the informal sectors. Uh, but I will talk about more about the home-based workers because we are uh, organizing them. Like we are saying that in Pakistan, uh, there are 20 million uh, informal workers are engaged uh, with different sectors and out of which 12 million are the uh, uh, women, women workers. In there. So our Pakistani economy, you can say it is mainly dominated by the informal sector. It's, you can say that it's 70, 70 to 70, 75% are the informal workers. Uh, total of the uh, total of our workforce, like we have the workforce of 65 million, 
so majority like 70% are the informal workers they are doing different kind of work and not only in uh, textile but also the other sectors as well so uh, most women in pakistan are part of the informal uh, informal economy or low wage labor market because they are getting very less payment and even they are not access to the uh, social security net even they don't have any protection and, and uh, during corona it's multiplied uh, their miseries is multiplied so that's how the uh, informal uh, the supply chain works here like the uh, uh, brand work uh, the brand is uh, uh, located in one country and they are producing or taking I see that there's something wrong with your connection. Zera, you seem to be falling out for a while. Yeah. Mobile call sometimes, so it's interrupt. Mm -hmm. um, we'll yeah, see. Do you want to say something, Nasir? Uh, she is uh, in another room. May I help her? Um, well, maybe she can. If uh, wait, let's see. If it's not reacting now, we can maybe just go to the next question and then see um, how it will, uh, how she will get back and will be able to join us. Um, so yeah, Sarah was actually also kind in, in the middle of talking about it. The, um, the textile and apparel industry in Pakistan is. Uh, is its second largest employer after agriculture. Um, a study by the Human Rights Watch estimated that almost 38% of the manufacturing labor force is working in the garment industry. Um, yet garment workers have struggled more than anyone in, in unionizing and connecting with each other. Um, and Nasir, you work for the a deputy, as deputy general secretary for the National Trade Union Federation Pakistan. Uh, so connecting these people and making sure their voices are heard is something that you've been fighting for for a long time already. Um, could you maybe explain why it is that these garment workers experience such difficulties in, in unionizing and what the, the obstacles are that they have to overcome in doing so and how your work is also helping them? Uh, first, I want to clear it. Uh... When, uh, when we talked about a textile and garment, then is the 38 percent. But if we talked about a cotton-related factory, cotton from whole supply chain, from cotton field to the factory, so it's uh, more than 60 yeah. percent total work, including uh, cotton uh, fields. The workers work over there, and we are going to also organize them in a supply chain because if the workers in a uh, Cotton fields, they are not uh, producing uh, cotton without the slavery, without uh, bounded labor. So how could the cloth will be clean? So that's why we are raising that question that a supply chain should be more deepen to the, not just the factories, but also to the uh, cotton fields. So that is the one thing. So uh, you talked about uh, unionization in uh, textile and garment. I think that, uh, less than 1% workers are organizing textile and garment. So it's a very uh, unfortunate and uh, uh, it's a very pessimistic uh, uh, numbers. It's because uh, in majority of factories, especially in textile and garments, workers don't have a written contracts. So if you want to register a worker, it will requirement of the registration that anybody can show that he or she is employed with that factory. If the workers don't have the appointment letter, they can't register themselves with the as a union with the factory, the labor department. So that is the one problem. The other big problem is that workers are not, only a 5% workers are registered with the social security and uh, uh, pension schemes. And these, uh, there is also a problem that uh, employer just pay the fee of uh, contribution of a worker, but the, what the card they get from the Social Security Institute, it was not given to the worker. The company 
keep it with them and just give the 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 institute uh, social security institute that get the money and they don't care about that uh, that that card will should go to the workers so that is another problem so i think that in, in that context we have taken a new initiative we have tried to ask the government and legislate try to make a legislation with the government that uh, there should be a, a sectoral unions just like in a europe in pakistan there is a no sectoral union every factory have a union and that union only have a negotiation or a collective bargaining with the for that factory not for the whole sector so if we have a union of for whole sector it will resolve the problem but it need a legislation on it and we started to work on it but now is the condition is that uh, because uh, even before the after the agreement with the imf there was a lot of resentment in the workers and workers were very much uh, angry on it but now uh, before the corona there was a problem that we always motivate the people motivate the workers mobilize the workers to come for their rights on the demonstration or activities but this is a new phenomena in pakistan and this new phenomena is that if workers are punished tensely themselves they are coming out of the factories first they protest inside the factory then they get out of the factory they go to the press clubs and uh, open on the they block the roads that is a new phenomena it, it was uh, in 1969 when all over the world there was a left movement and a uh, uh, students movement was there in 1960 the same was in pakistan the workers and the uh, students they come out in the fact in in a huge numbers against the state and now again is the new phenomenon that the workers are coming out everywhere they do, if they don't have union no problem they are very much now is angry violent and a militant but they are not a unified actions they are a separated action but the same kind of action because the labor department is are not doing for them anything the local system of to resolve the mechanism don't resolve their issues that's why they are going to the street and they want a uh, street justice so number of factories in number of factories worker get their rights they after they have cordoned down of the factories they are picketing at a dharna at the factory so the they force the employer to accept their demands so that is a new phenomena and i think that uh, it will be a culminated on a new kind of a uh, labor movement is more than a trade union movement is it would be a informal way of a trade union because formal way of a trade union is failed because in a tripartite mechanism whatever they have agreed to do it they don't accept it the employer sit with us they agree with us just like they agree with us that if during the lockdown all worker will get their salaries or no worker will be retrenched we force the government to give them a uh, some kind of uh, incentive to so state bank of pakistan given a 3% uh, on interest 3% interest loan for 5 to 6 years at the time when there was interest rate was a 13% the government is giving to the employer on a 3% so but they get the money they get all the benefits but they don't want to give to the worker whatever they have discussed and agree in a tripartite mechanism so that is a frustration and people are taking a new way to cope with the situation and we are as a trade union we are going with them we involve with them to channelize their uh, activities everywhere so first time is that uh, in the last 3 months the national trade union federation become a focal and a pivotal point for the workers wherever they are fighting we are with them that is a new era for us in the labor movement in pakistan yes because i also read that um of course the corona lockdown um confronted us all with challenges such as the question of how these demonstrations or how protest can take place now with social distancing for instance um and last month um 
NTUF um, did organize a demonstration, but that one was met with oppression and with violence by um, the police. Can you maybe? Yeah, I, I'll let you. It was not. Uh, it was not organized by us, but our uh, comrades who work in that factory, they were in it. Yeah. So it was a spontaneous uh, reaction of the workers. It was a uh, denim clothing which is produced is producing for H and M, Inditex, and H and M and Azara. So in that factory they have retrained 15,000 workers from their eight units, yeah? And the remaining, they don't want to give them a bonus, which is due on an Eid festival. Yeah. So there was a frustration in the workers and workers get, get out of the factory and they organize a peaceful demonstration. Then there was a firing on the workers. And the workers were, after Eid, they have filed a one case with the police and they have arrested the workers. That was the case. But it has flared up uh, the problem. So when there was a firing and then when there was workers were arrested, so the employer was also become a fearful. They was uh, they think that there was a retaliation. So there was a uh, indirectly in a background there was a, a pressure from the government and also pressure from the other employers that that was a not good thing and anything can be happened. That's why number of factories after that firing workers were paid their salaries and also their bonuses. And, and they were uh, very much fearful that there might be a retaliation from the workers. So we have also going to file a complaint with the, our uh, international partners with the H&M that uh, in their factories they are getting work in a very a uh, slavery in a just like a the workers work under a in a slave just like a slave in the factories yes um it's sad to see that sarah um has left us again but i'm pretty sure that she's trying now to get in again um but let's just move on and see when she's back then uh, we can continue our talk with her as well um but I'm also wondering because, um, as you say, there are, of course, you already mentioned it right in the beginning of, of these big apparel brands cancelling orders, um, violating labor regulations and laws. And I think I can say that there is this intuitive logic um, that big companies have an obligation um, to ensure that the workers' rights in their supply chains are protected. Um, that's also what several organizations and campaigns and trade unions are fighting for, are pleading for, um, and that companies should show um, solidarity and responsibility with their workers. But perhaps solidarity alone is not enough. And um, what we need is political action by international trade unions, but also by regulation supported by the EU governments. Um, what are your thoughts and, and hopes uh, when it comes to reorganizing the industry, Nasir? Yeah, one thing is that uh, you see Pakistan signed a number of uh, global framework agreements. Pakistan have a GSP plus mechanism with the European Union. Pakistan have signed uh, and ratified a 38 ILO conventions. Yeah, so number of conventions are there, but still uh, there is no practical purpose is all of it. So it needs that uh, on a paper, things are very good. And when they are in a negotiation table internationally and locally, employers and number of these big organizations, they are very polite and uh, pro workers are human rights. But in a practice, they don't have anything, uh, any mechanism for it. Just like an industrial global union have a, a global framework, uh, agreements with the different brands, but there is a no mechanism about it. How would we go for a complaint system? The same is with the GSP plus. Pakistan get a GSP plus status with the European Union and uh, the, there is a zero uh, duty on a Pakistani product going to Europe. But there is a no mechanism for it. There are 29 uh, points, including uh, labor rights in it. But everywhere there is a violation and nobody is care about it and workers don't have any mechanism 
to how to make a complaint and there is a no monitoring system so that's why we think that uh, there need a new kind of a uh, watchdog with a very active uh, people and uh, not only a workers but a people's participation conscious people's participation the workers uh, from different political spectrum social democrats greens left uh, ultra left communist all anarchists all come together because the problem is in the south is that we are not that strong we are not that strong to raise our voices it need a, a political dimension of a things and that dimension in a europe we need a, some kind of a voices who can raise our voices over there so we think that a problem is a global one is a trust border problem because uh, the whole capital is moving from a uh, come uh, from a north to south and south to north and then again north so if the problem and the money and the capital is from all the global and the problem is a global one so we have to look into a globally otherwise we never resolve the issue number of times number of examples we have when we act unitedly from north and south we get a result just like a baldia ali enterprise factory fire uh, there was a problem in pakistan 2260 worker died and we raise our voices when in a germany human rights trade unions and a peoples and workers right organization collaborate with us cooperate with us we put a dent and we put a pressure on a cake and we get number of compensation from them still way short of our expectation but it was a beginning that uh, in a history of ilo we are first time get a compensation uh, through a ilo convention on a compensation so in that context we can say that uh, international solidarity in in era of corona and after corona it will play a very very significant role just like in uh, your america you see that uh, people are coming out when a black boy was uh, died because of uh, something the police has brutality yeah. we are using these symbols in pakistan also that the same kind of we are not taking we are not giving us a chance to be people use that slogan so it means that things are becoming a global one and the oppression is the same with different degrees so in that concept we think that uh, we should look into a very seriously about it otherwise in a south we can't uh, uh, survive in that way if we don't have our voices and our friends in the north yeah thank you um i also quickly saw that sera was also able to join again so perhaps if um i don't know if she's able to yes i can hear you yes and is your camera working as well or no i don't think so it's working yeah okay then we'll just try it like this it's it's, it's fine um okay maybe it, it's a question actually that we got from uh, from the people watching us but it also connects to what you said nasir of the fact that we need this global and this political action but there's a question from a viewer who asked what he or she can do as a consumer um should I, as a consumer, buy a T-shirt from H&M, or shouldn't I do that? I don't know if you can uh, answer to this, Sera, or if you, Nasir, that's up to you, of course. Uh, I think that it's not an answer. If you don't uh, buy a thing, it means that uh, somewhere someone lost their job, yeah? But, you can see that you can say that you can you have a voice that you can say that uh, this cloth which is you are buying it should be a uh, produce in an environment where the safety of the workers is a first and workers get uh, some kind of a decent wage that you can say that and uh, that can happen and and we can do it so it's not a it's not not buying is not a uh, it is all the issue i think that uh, from workers perspective we think that we should ask them if they respect ilo conventions 
they respect Pakistani law in theory. They should respect them in a practice. And it's not a impossible for them because if they give a, a for one t-shirt, if they will double the price, double the wage of the worker, it will be a 0 0.5, 0 0.50 cent. Yeah. So it, it no problem for the consumer, even no problem for their profit. So why the workers' salaries are wages are so low? So we can say that uh, just like H and M say that in 2019, the H and M will give a decent wages to living wage to all the workers in their supply chain. He has committed, but the H and M didn't do that one. So I think that it is a possible that a worker will get a, a social security, worker will get a pension, worker will get a, a living wage, and even the, the, the profit of the uh, supplier and profit of the brand will not affect. So yeah. the yeah, I think that a consumer can pay, play a very important role in it. They yes, question. I Yes, I also agree with the uh, comment Nasir that uh, our people need job first thing. So consumer, we can use the consumer as a pressure group to, uh, to pressurize the brand and even EU government and other government that from the, where they are getting the their merchandise, they should follow the rule, rules and laws and regulations. So that will, that, that will be better us yes yeah very clear thank you and uh, maybe zera now that you're back because <laughs> uh, you were talking actually about the women in the informal industry um and their share in, in, in the garment and textile production um could you maybe continue where uh, where you left the discussion um about their share and their importance of um in the whole industry uh, yes, uh, I think uh, where I left it, <laughs> I think I, I, I have to start uh, in another, another way. Like uh, garment industry is rapidly uh, shifting from formal to informal work, including homes. So uh, where local and international, um, uh, both workers are, um, uh, work is going on. So the women in Pakistan are traditionally basically a skilled one. Uh, uh, they specialize in swing and embroidery and, and the skill passed down from one generation to another generation, another. And now their work is growing in textile, especially in stitching departments. Uh, this also means that the share of the women in government uh, or the value added product or the work is increasing. Similarly, if the work is being transferred at the home, uh, they are being provided uh, work at home by the third party contract system or the contractors or the middleman so which is of very low value such as like cropping button uh, buttoning on the shirt or embroidery work or the work uh, of the bed sheet folding the bed sheet sides of the bed sheet it is not visible yet uh, uh, but uh, you can see that uh, uh, that the home-based workers are coming in the supply chain. They are linked with some brand locally or internationally, but it's not visible because we don't have any data or any research on it, any research on it. So there is a lot of work we have to do on on this of to collect the data. Like I give one example that our members are engaged with the WWF work. It's a brand, WWF. And they are stitching school bags for for the uh, children in Africa. When uh, one reporter came to us and he, she did interview with uh, the whole home based workers and she printed that uh, uh, article in the newspaper, uh, which is published in in African country in one of the African country. So the members getting phone from their employers. For middlemen or for, from their contractor that uh, you have lied about us and uh, we are not giving you work so that's how we find that supply chain that our members are engaged with the wbf in africa so in the same way uh, and, and in the second way you can say that the owner is uh, working through contractor who are linked with the uh, workers outside the factory so there is one proof that 
so there is no proof that uh, their work is done outside the factory. Uh, the greed of profit drives uh, employers uh, to a place where they have more advantage or the benefits. That is why in garment where there is a value added work uh, and sitting work, you can say, uh, there are women, they hire a lot of women. Simply they are now seeing uh, seeing that if uh, the profit is working from the home, so they shift the work from uh, the work from factory to home. Uh, like we have an example of the sport goods, like football, many football are, teachers are working at home in small stitching units in Salford. And garment, it, garment industry is fully, uh, you can say that the women are engaged as a uh, contract workers in factories as well, you know, on the piece suit, and even in home. So they are not getting paid uh, betterly, or you can say that uh, that is up to the minimum wage of the which we the province have. So this is the issue which they are facing, and uh, the workers, especially the women workers, are facing in uh, this whole supply chain. Hello. 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 Oh, ah, yeah. Sorry, it was my mistake. I'm sorry. Hmm. So now you can hear me. Yeah, everything is fine. Yeah. yeah okay. Great. Um, Zira, to quickly go back, um, and also to maybe reflect a bit on your work, as I also asked about Nasir, how he's resisting or helping these voices of these garment workers uh, heard. Um, a couple of years ago, the Home-Based Women Workers Federation uh, managed to get a local policy. Um, addressing the rights of the home workers legalized uh, by the state, which was a huge thing because it was the first time that the rights of the home workers had been legally addressed. Um, but reading on the labor violations that are still happening today, um, yeah, made me somehow realize that the Pakistan government, um, who should be accountable for these white for these labor violations, not to happen, are failing to do so. Um, and knowing that almost 70% of the country's export comes from the garment industry, um, one would expect the government to um, take care of it, but they aren't, it seems. Um, it seems they're handing over the industry to the first of these big profit uh, brands in the global north. Um, how does this happen? Has it always been like this, or is it a trend that has been reinforced by neoliberalist thinking of the last decades? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, in, new, in new liberal policies, the privatization is the main uh, main way that uh, government is supplying to curtail the rights of the trade union, basically. So the informal workers is, uh, work is also increased. Uh, and uh, what we did that we organized these home-based workers because the majority are the women in the home-based sector. So that's why we went to these women and organized them and asked them to come and sit in, at one place. And then we started the study circle and training with these home-based workers. And we make them uh, aware that if they will not come out from their home or they will not organize themselves in a union or in a group or a pressure group, the, the, uh, the state will not give anything. So they understand, the old women understand this. So we came out from home to road. So that's how we uh, uh, we are able to get some relief from the uh, government. Like uh, you said that uh, it's the first time in the history of Pakistan that one province has ratified or you can say that recognize the home-based workers as a labor. So now in Sindh province, all the home-based workers, either they are women or men, they all are considered now as a 
worker and they will uh, get the benefit which is written in the labor law or in, in, in the labor law so that's how we are working here in pakistan uh, and we are still hopeful that uh, um, like we have many things on the pipeline but because of the coronavirus it stopped many things like uh, our uh, council has still we didn't uh, the government is didn't announce the council uh, which is uh, which has the main role that uh, they will collect the data of home based workers in one province that how many home based workers are uh, exist in sind and with which sector so we can clearly say because we don't have the data so we can't say anything what we have seen is just a estimation about the workers formal workers or about the informal worker that is just a estimation because we don't have the data so that's why we are asking for the data to government for the formal workers as well and for the informal workers as well so uh, but the the thing is that like uh, uh, like you said that uh, the labor department is also working with the employers so it is very difficult to work and to understand all the mechanism so the thing which we did here is that we due to our activism we become the part of the tripartite mechanism so first time the informal workers become the part of all the tripartite mechanism which we had in sin like we are sitting in the uh, labor standing committee and its work is that uh, you have we have that right that we can formulate a new law or amend the law even we are sitting in the minimum wage board like i am the member of now i am the member of the minimum wage board as well so we have uh, uh we have also working on the minimum wage for these workers as well yes so i i want to share uh, things I'll, that uh, i think you can if you wanted to say something now sir yeah uh, i said that uh, there's a, a one side of is a, a trade union side a labor side of that uh, economic side of uh, the whole dimension of this uh, supply chain the other one is a political dimension of it and uh, because of a corona now our uh, demands which were a blur before the corona now it become a uh, more visible and more acceptable to the ordinary people and the public just like when the state say that uh, pakistan is a security state and the pakistani state have uh, Uh, their borders are not safe and the, they are the enemy of the pakistan so that we need a, a huge budget for the defense and when we say that uh, we need a education health and to make a much more money on it when the corona was there so at that time the doctors and the health system was failed to uh, work the whole health system was collapsed so we demanded from the government that uh, in a new budget there would be a, a equal amount uh, earmark for a health and education as equal to the uh, defense budget before that we were saying for the cancellation of a uh, international uh, all the debts it nobody care about us but now the government of pakistan itself along with the ethiopia and many other country they are also demanding that one and today uh, their loan were deferred for one month one year but we say that for can for the cancellation of the loan that is another one thing the most important thing was that from the workers perspective we were saying that uh, there would be a, there should be there must be a, a universalization of uh, a health and a social security system and now the government is looking into it and uh, how could they will do it so that is the way and for all these designation whatever we are thinking about a corona as a political statement we uh, demonstration everything and then we have uh, written a pamphlet and it was went to 70000 whose household to give to the different people so we have uh, make our commitment with the political perspective to the people that uh, we are not just for a leave work we have given a leave to the 550 to 5 5000 families immediately after the corona spread and then uh, from our own uh, ntf platform and with the other philanthropist organization we gave to a 
50,000 families uh, one month uh, ration to, to them and also contribute some money with the Pakistan's uh, medical, uh, prime medical association, doctors and the paramedical association. We work with them around the 150,000 pamphlet we uh, distributed. We have uh, pasted uh, banners and number of things in a different uh, industrial zones. Whenever there is a problem with the worker, worker will come to us and we resolve their problem uh, with the labor department and we will go to the court. We have also find a constitutional petition with in a higher court about the right of workers, right of livelihood and right of their wages. So in that context, we are working on a different dimensions. The Another dimension is this one. Uh, we are talking with you as an international issue. We are making it, uh, we think that uh, it will not be resolved if we don't have a international dimension of that one. And that dimension is a very vital and very important and a very decisive because the crisis is a global one. Yes, yes. Um, I also hear that um, um, it makes you to yourself a lot because there's like a very bad feedback. So we've lost it or is it? Could maybe, I am, now it's over. Okay, that's perfect, thank you. Um, so I've got a question and it connects again to the, to, the, to the first one actually. So the question of whether or not as a consumer we should buy clothes, whether or not from H&M or no. Um, but here it's a question from somebody asking if there are any labels that we can use to recognize fair working conditions. Um, are there brands that work globally that can serve as an example and things we can uh, go to as an alternative? Maybe if some of you wants to answer to this, Nasir, Sera. I don't. Sorry, um, I don't understand. No, no problem. No, no problem. Your voice you is not here. I'll ask it again. I'll ask it once more. So it's a question by somebody from the uh, audience asking if there are labels that we can use that we can depend on, um, and that show us that the working conditions. Uh, have been respected, that these working conditions in which these t-shirts or these garments have been produced um, are just, were human. Um, and he's also wondering if there are brands that work globally that can serve as, a, as an example, brands we should look for when going shopping and things that we know that are better, cleaner, more sustainable than other ones. Hey. I can't mention a single brand who are getting their merchandise from the South. Uh, they are not, they are very much uh, in a work to respect our labor standards. Yeah. So it needs a long way to do it because they are used to cheat the consumers. It's not a, a fault of the consumers, but they show to them that uh, they have the global framework agreement they have a social responsibility on a Facebook or on their uh, website. They say that they respect all these things. And the problem is that the, with the consumer and the producer, the workers in the supply chain, they don't have a link with each other. That's why the brands and the suppliers are cheating the workers and the brands are cheating to the consumers. So we need a very strong connection with the consumers and the workers in a supply chain. That will expose the uh, wrongdoing of the suppliers and the brands. So I think that uh, for the decades they are doing in the same practice. They have uh, just like uh, social auditing, they get an audit from some uh, repute organization and show the people that, okay, all things are very good over here, yeah? So these social auditing are the private one and they are getting a money from the buyers and the suppliers. So they give whatever they want to get it. So we think we have to understand their tools to cheat consumers. So we can uh, aware the consumer about it and we can resolve that issue if the uh, consumer have a consciousness about it and they know the tactics of the brands, how to 
hide their their ugly faces so we can we purchase the things but we ask them the questions yes. and we raise the issues like that yes uh, maybe a very um question to both of you actually to wrap this conversation up um as this conversation has showed uh, and as he's been saying like several of these labor violations that are happening now um had already been happening long before the outbreak of COVID-19. I'm, for instance, talking about the fact that a lot of the garment workers don't have a, con a contract with the factories they're working for, um, which makes them, of course, very vulnerable because they lack any sort of social protection. Um, but also like the, the, the lack of safety measures, the protection, the health measures. Um, optimists might say that these crises that had been going on already for a long time are now laid bare somehow because of COVID-19. Um, besides, you also see people gathering and unionizing. Um, so these are can, can be signs that change is already or somehow very slowly um, on its way. And that connects uh, to this common held idea of um, that out of times of crisis, actual change um, can grow. And without minimizing the devastating effects of the situation of all these people that are working in the garment industry today, um, I'm wondering what you think uh, the outcome of this crisis will be. And if you think that COVID-19 will be able to somehow demand a reorganization of the garment industry and also enforce this responsibility of those people that should take responsibility, like the big brands and um, do you are you somehow optimistic um that this can happen due to um the outbreak zera would you talk i'm zera would you answer i think that zera is responded to us that she has a very bad technology and it's not working so it would be good if um, you can would you hear me Would you hear me? Would you yeah. hear me? Yeah. Yes. yes. Okay. So I think that uh, uh, what is happening at the moment, how the workers and the people are reacting uh, about the fear of states, especially uh, I talked with the on Pakistani protect perspective, the Pakistani state failed to protect workers and on every occasion. So that this government come with a very much fun fear, but they, every day there is a crisis. So in a Corona crisis, now the workers are on the road, they are protesting and they are raising the issues for which for we, we have been asking them for the two, four or five decades we are working, asking the workers about it. Now workers themselves, they are saying that things and they are more radical than us they are they are much more open they are much more in a uh, you can say that uh, in a demonstration and a protest so i think that uh, the same is situation in india the same is situation in a bangladesh and other countries so i think that uh, a new material conditions are emerging at the time we are facing all the crises and uh, there is a uh, unemployment, livelihood has gone, but at the same time, the workers are now much more and the people are much more inclined to listen a political a solution of the thing. So I think that uh, after a corona, during the coronavirus and after the coronavirus, the movement will take a new leap and it will it is a launching pad for a new era for us. And especially I think that uh, in Pakistan, we have a uh, new ways and a new, I can, I, I don't say that is an opportunity, but is a material condition, which is, which is open and now bourgeois parties, the mainstream parties, they are least bothered about workers and the people's issue. That's why people are looking for a new alternate 
a political dimension and a political organization uh, other than the existing political parties who don't care about the workers and the people so the same i think that the international issue is there so i think that uh, in a corona we have uh, some material conditions and a prerequisite so have a new kind of a change which is a social one and it will uh, drastically change the way of life and also the states uh, the, the people and behavior people's are uh, thinking towards the states and they come to know that these are the state which are easily will fail to resolve the people's issue at the time of uh, virus yes yes i think we need to make a strategy a clear strategy like we uh, we can work in a three three level uh, like uh, nasa said in pakistan we have uh, the new venues uh, on which we can gather or uh, organize the workers to demand for their just right so we have we need a global alliance as well first thing is that and we need also a global laws like uh, we have raised and you have raised the issue of uh, baldia factory fire so ue is now uh, preparing a new law that uh, if the brand is going anywhere of, in the world they should be follow the rule of what is passed in the uh, eu or european union or any other country so we we want we have to ask now the global laws as well and we need the global campaign as well like uh, the, all the employers have the one platform like imf world bank uh, britain wood organization and other organization and they are they are thinking on how they will uh, get the benefit from all these kind of things so i think the worker should also need some kind of that kind of a platform if we raise the voice from here then you can also uh, or the workers from other country can also raise the voice so it's i think we have to uh, we have we need a joint struggle on one issue or two issue like we are taking one issue as a contractor that we don't need any contract system anymore so in one action should be taken at global level so i think these kind of strategy if we can go for it also then maybe we can achieve a lot of things thank you very much um i'm watching at my time and um i'm afraid we've come to the end of this live stream um i want to thank you i want to thank my two beautiful guests nasser mansour zera khan um for being here with me tonight um for teaching us on the problematic situation of the garment production in pakistan today but also and mainly um for your inspirational thoughts and ideas on how to make the current system more sustainable and more um, just for the future. Um, then the only today, June 25th at 6 p.m. Um, and connecting to the tragic murder of John Floyd and the growing worldwide resistance against it, we will look deeper into uh, racial justice and violence inflicted by state police and border control agents along the European uh, borders. So thank you all once more, Nasir Zera, for being here um, with me tonight. And I hope you all see, I hope to see you all again uh, within two weeks. Thank you. Okay, thank you.